Exploring the history of cannabis culture. One artifact and interview at a time. This is Canthropology. Presented by the World of Cannabis Museum Project. With your host, World of Cannabis Executive Director, Bobby Black. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Canthropology. I'm your host, World of Cannabis Executive Director, Bobby Black. Thanks for joining us. Today's episode is a special one for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, it's the first episode we're conducting on Zoom, so you have this lovely video element. Um, it's the first one we've done with multiple guests, so that should be fun. And most importantly, it's special because this episode is a tribute to one of the most influential cannabis advocates and activists ever, Dr. Lester Grinspoon, who passed away just a few weeks ago. Uh, for any of you out there who are not familiar with Dr. Grinspoon, please allow me uh, to offer a brief introduction before we delve into all the good details. Dr. Lester Grinspoon was born on June 24th, 1928 in Newtown, Massachusetts. He attended nearby Harvard Medical School where he received his doctorate in psychiatry and went on to teach for decades there at Harvard before retiring in 2000 as an associate professor. He was the author of over 150 articles in various scientific journals, as well as 12 books, including two on cannabis, Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine in 1993, and the classic Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971, which to this day is hailed as a landmark in medical marijuana research. Dr. Grinspoon devoted the last 50 years of his life to advocating for the legalization of cannabis in Congress, in courtrooms, and in the boardroom of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. For these reasons, he is widely regarded as the godfather of the medical marijuana movement. Dr. Grinspoon passed away peacefully on the morning of June 25th at his home in the suburbs of Boston with his wife of 66 years, Betsy, at his side after having celebrated his 92nd birthday the day before. Now, being that this podcast is about the history of cannabis culture, I felt it only right that we devote an episode to honoring the life and legacy of this extraordinary icon. And to do just that, we are privileged to have with us on the program today some of those who knew the good doctor best, members of his family, friends, and colleagues, all of whom it's my pleasure to introduce to you now. First up, we have one of Dr. Grinspoon's sons. He's an astrobiologist and author who has served as the former chair of astrobiology for the Library of Congress as well as the current adjunct professor at Georgetown University and senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Please welcome David Grinspoon. Hi, David. Hi there, Bobby. Thanks. Thanks a lot for doing this. It's uh, great to be able to see and talk to you all this afternoon. Absolutely. Uh, next up, she's the co-founder of WAM, the Women's Alliance for Medical Marijuana, the first nonprofit medical cannabis collective to be recognized by the U.S. government. She's also a co-author of California's Compassionate Use Act, better known as Prop 215, the first law passed to legalize the use of medical marijuana in the U.S. Valerie Leveroni Corral is with us. Hello, Valerie. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to, to join you today. I'm really glad you're doing this and enlightening many people who should know or and perhaps don't know about the great Dr. Lester Grinspoon, both mentor and truly icon in this movement. All right. Up next, we have the founder, former executive director, and current legal counsel for Normal, Mr. Keith Straub. Welcome back to the show, Keith. Thank you, Bobby. Nice to be with you. Uh, next, we have another former executive director of Normal, who also served as the founding executive director of the Normal Foundation, Mr. Alan St. Pierre. Alan, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate what you're doing for Lester. And last but certainly not least, we have my old colleague, former associate publisher of High Times, founding partner of the Whoopi and Maya cannabis brand and National Normal Board member, Mr. Rick Music. Rick, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much, Rob. And uh, man, uh, Lester was maybe the best guy I ever knew in my life. And I'm really, really happy you're doing this. Thank you. I should also remember that I should also mention that uh, we have. Three of you are part of our World of Cannabis uh, Advisory Board, 
Rick, Valerie, and Keith, all of, all of whom are on our advisory board. So we're very honored to have you all on this show. Um, uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, one of Lester's other sons, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, was also planning to be with us. But unfortunately, he had a last minute scheduling conflict and he couldn't make it. Before we delve into Lester's celebrated cannabis career achievements, I'd like to first provide our audience with a little background on his life. Uh, talk about Lester the man, the father, the psychologist, and the scholar. Uh, so I'd like to begin with you, David. Uh, can you please tell us a little about your dad's upbringing, his values, his passions, and what it was like having him as your dad? Yeah, I mean, um, Lester was, um, I think his uh, character and personality to some degree came out of his own personal experience um, growing up uh, during the Depression. And, um, you know, he kind of, he had a, a challenging early life in some regards his his family was uh was poor and um they had to deal with some uh anti-semitism you know my dad got beat up a bunch of times when he was a kid um you know just on the schoolyard kind of stuff but you know um he uh he had to uh overcome things like that um and um his own father died uh when when he was fairly young. And I think all that um, made him uh, just very, um, it added to a kind of uh, perseverance and, and sort of toughness that he had. I mean, that, that you, when you met him, you wouldn't say, oh, this guy's tough because he was a very sweet and intellectual professorial kind of guy. But in his approach to the things that he cared about, he was kind of fearless and undaunted. And I think some of that came out of his life history of just not having it so easy when, when he was young. Um, and um, he was also just very, very, um, very much an intellectual and a scientist. Um, I think of him as sort of the smartest person I ever knew, um, not just in terms of the obvious stuff that he was an expert on, but just his approach to, um, he was just very curious. And, um, you know, he would just, when I was a kid, he would just teach me things like how, like how to make a siphon, you know, like, and how gravity works. And, and he would just loved the natural world. He loved to walk in the woods and look at birds. And, you know, he was just really curious and, and loved learning, um, really loved books and learning. And, and I think for him also, again, coming out of that background of kind of uh, poverty and, and some deprivation, I think also books and learning for him were like an avenue to a whole other world. It was how he ultimately became successful and, um, uh, you know, not wealthy, but comfortably middle-class um, and sort of entered into this larger world of, um, of science and intellectualism. And, um, you know, so I think for him books, uh, it, it was almost like a sacred thing, books and learning. And then, as far as his approach to what he became really famous for, uh, he was just very much a scientist and he approached it uh, from the standpoint of looking at evidence. And again, you know, thinking about how he came into the issue uh, skeptical um, and then uh, became convinced by the evidence. You know, there's a real power in that, that like he was driven to his beliefs by what he could learn about it, not starting from a position and then trying to support that like a pseudoscientist. And that gave a real power to what what he did and how he approached things. And then, you know, as far as how he was as a father, in some ways, um, he would, people would be surprised that we had, you know, sort of a very conventional household. I mean, people were always like, oh, he must have been so cool having Lester Grinspoon as a dad, you know? And like, of course it was. And I appreciated that more and more as I got older. But when we were kids, you know, I mean, he was a great father, but it was also a fairly conventional, strict um, household in some ways. And in one way in particular, like when he, when I was a teenager and he found out that I had some marijuana, uh, like when I was 13, he got really mad at me and was very strict about it. And he was like, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, we can talk about whether you should be using this or not, but I'm mad at you for like uh, sneaking around and being deceptive, you know? And like, you know, we had to kind of work through that just like any parent and a kid would. And so 
um, you know, and, and he, he uh, came to believe that, um, that adult use was fine and that in some circumstances uh, it was good for kids too, like for medical conditions and stuff, but he definitely was not like, oh, anything goes, you know? Um, so there were some aspects of our, of our upbringing, I think that would also um, kind of surprise people. But again, it was sort of Lester's mix of being kind of a conventional person with his radical ability to just see the evidence through and reach a conclusion that was his power because he came across and, you know, to people that met him was like, Oh, this guy's a, he's not a hippie. He's a professor, you know, and he spoke like a professor and he had that kind of authority that he brought to the issue. Um, and, and again, that, um, that sort of conventionality, um, I think would have, would have surprised some people, uh, and, and in a way was, was part of his superpower. Yeah. You know, I, I learned, uh, while participating in, in the touching, uh, virtual funeral service and the sitting sativa, uh, memorial that you guys set up, which were, which were lovely. Um, I learned a lot about his personal life, which I didn't know cause I wasn't very close with him. Uh, for example, that I knew he had, that he identified with his Jewish heritage, but he was really more of an atheist. Um, I learned that a lot of his old friends apparently call him Chuck, which is short for chuckles. Uh, you know, and then I also love that learned that he loved fishing and apparently had a sailboat nicknamed the 420. David, could you maybe address any of those points? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, it was funny when he was, um, especially when we were younger, all of like um, our like uncles and uh, some of our older cousins always called him Chuck and Uncle Chuck, which um, I never really knew what the story was of that for a number of years. And it was just kind of surprising because like, well, my dad's name is Lester. Why are you calling him Chuck? That's it. His name's not Charles, you know? But then, yeah, it did turn out. I learned that that was because when he was a little kid, he laughed easily. And so his parents started calling him Chuckles. And that was why a lot of older relatives, his nickname was Chuck. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, that was kind of fun. Um, and yeah, he, he loved to fish and he loved to sail. And he had a he had a racing sailboat um, that was called the 420. I mean, that's actually that you can look it up. There's a kind of racing sailboat that's the 420, which is 4.2 meters, and uh, that's an old that's an old term. It's been around for decades. And at the time, this was like in the you know um, in the 70s when I had never heard the term 420 for marijuana. It was just Lester's boat was the 420. And, and we were all sort of scared of it because he was kind of a daredevil on the 420. He was like, oh, no, who's got to go out in the 420 with, with dad today? You know, I'm sorry. It's your turn. You know, good luck. <laughs> and, and, um, and then later on, I, 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 it occurred to me. I put that together. It's like, oh, wait a minute, 420, you know, because that, that so term came out of a completely different place. <laughs> yeah. So appropriate, you know, like who would have, you know, imagined. Um, have any of you other guys uh, been out on the boat uh, besides David with Lester? Yeah, this is Alan. Um, I, for many years, enjoyed fishing with Lester uh, on Cape Cod, uh, where he really was a very good fisherman and probably more importantly, really looked forward to eating everything that we caught right down to the bone. Uh, he was uh, really um, uh, a fish gastrona. He really loved it. Um, and while we could certainly talk about marijuana on an eight or 10 hour uh, boat ride, and we enjoyed it while we were out there, for me, it was the joy of actually talking about all kinds of other things other than marijuana policy or the plant per se, um, talking about Lester's life and his philosophy and things that had influenced him. And, and he asked me of the same. And so it was a real enjoyable uh, time to be with him uh, outside of the conventionalities of work and, and normal and marijuana law reform. Um, I did have the pleasure, and I could probably write a, a small play about taking Lester and his brother, uh, whose name is Harold, but he also has a nickname, Bud. And so um, uh, one morning uh, we picked up uh, Bud at about 5 a.m. And, and he got on the boat and he said, well, good morning, Chuckles. And that's when I discovered this nickname for Lester. Uh, which I, I, I looked both and I said, well, who are you speaking to? He goes, Lester. I said, Lester? Lester? Lester Grinsby, you call Lester Chuckles. And he says, yeah. <laughs> and uh, from that point forward, I always, you know, just sort of appreciated the fact that uh, 
Lester had this long, loving uh, relationship with his brother, uh, where they both had these loving nicknames for each other, even though for most you know purposes, no one would know either of them by you know these names. <laughs> so yeah, he was great. He was hang- wonderful to hang around with, and um, I got to discover from the services too things I didn't know about Lester. Uh, I, I knew him about it, but I didn't know that this was uh, a patterns of his life. Uh, it was discussed that he liked to go fast in cars, and that, I put two and two together, and the three or four times we drove together, I have to say, outside of a couple of Turkish taxi rides, uh, he probably has scared me the most uh, as a passenger in a car, uh, driving one time from the house in Wellesley out to Logan, and another time on Cape Cod, uh, trying to make it out to the low tide. <laughs> and uh, it discovered quickly, you know, how how much he enjoyed, um, you know, darting around in his Lexus while blasting Vivaldi. <laughs> I love it. Oh, man. So for, for most of Lester's career, he was primarily a psychiatrist and a teacher at Harvard. Uh, but things took a fateful turn in 1967 when he started work on the groundbreaking book that would forever change both his life and the fight for marijuana legalization. Uh, published in 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered was, according to you, Rick, uh, the book that started the movement. David and maybe Keith, can you tell us uh, what you know about how the book came together, why he chose to write the book about cannabis, and how his views on the subject evolved over the course of the book? Uh, I probably should defer to David because he'll know it firsthand. I think I have a pretty good sense, but please, David. <laughs> well, um, you know, I mean, you know, I, I do know it firsthand, but keep in mind, um, you know, in 1967, I was seven years old. So, uh, okay. you know, I I mean, I, I, I have definite memories of that time and I know the stories well, but probably some of them I know from, you know, hearing them rather than uh, firsthand experience. But um, okay. cer- certainly when, you know, when, uh, you know, Marijuana Reconsidered came out when I was 11 and um, my uh, my brother and I, my older brother Danny and I thought it was really cool that our dad wrote a book on this subject because, you know, we were, I mean, I was 11 and he was 13, but we were, you know, we were fans of the Beatles and getting into the Grateful Dead and, um, you know, all this stuff. And And so, of course, we were aware of like the counterculture and so it was definitely cool that our you know that our dad uh was working on this and then of course when he got asked to work with john lennon we were like oh okay we've got the coolest we realized we got the coolest dad ever but as as far as how he he got into it um he was first asked to um to testify or, or give a make a deposition for a trial uh, for a patient who um, had uh, some history with marijuana, and he did a little research project for that um, for that testimony he had to make. And in the process of that of that small research project, he saw enough to realize that there was more to the story than he thought, and that people in the academy thought. Uh, and based on that, he hit the books some more. Um, and then he started to realize, hey, I've come across something that is really counter to what people, you know, who are supposedly knowledgeable think. And for, for any kind of a scientist, and this is one thing I've learned as a scientist, I think I learned from my father, that that's really exciting. When as a scientist, you discover that people were wrong about something, then you go, oh, this is an interesting thing that I should follow up on because that's what science is all about. That's how science advances is by finding that what we thought about something was wrong. And so I think for him, it was like, Oh, wait a minute, there's something here. And the more he discovered that, the more he wanted to dive in. And that led to his first substantial publication on this, which was the scientific American article in 1969, which was a cover article in scientific American. And then uh, based on that um, and the reaction to that, he was encouraged to um, do a book length exposition of what he had learned, which was basically that uh, he realized that, as he said, he had been brainwashed along with everybody else into thinking that uh, marijuana was this dangerous substance. I learned that despite my training in medicine and science, I had been brainwashed like just about every other citizen in this country, that marijuana 
was not only a, not a dangerous drug, but indeed it was remarkably non-toxic. And uh, I had to uh, revise my view of it. You know, so I think he um, was fascinated by the intellectual puzzle of uh, how, how that brainwashing had happened and what the real truth was. And he, he just had this desire to uncover it, not just as an intellectual puzzle, but because it was connected to this uh, social problem that a lot of people were being persecuted unnecessarily. And so it, there was a little more charge than just like, oh, this is interesting intellectually. It was like, oh, this is important for social justice. And so that, you know, that led him to Marijuana Reconsidered. And then, of course, the reaction to that led to everything else that happened in his career. Yeah. Keith, um, so, you've often referred to Lester as the intellectual leader of the marijuana legalization movement. Can you please describe to us uh, why you feel that to be the case and what, in your assessment, was the impact of the book when it was released, both within the cannabis movement and in the general public? Um, yes, indeed. I, I think Lester, without question, was the intellectual leader of the entire movement from the moment his book was published in 71 forward, and maybe even back to the Scientific American article. Uh, I first met Lester when he was one of only two favorable witnesses, or, or at least pro decriminalization or legalization witnesses at the first set of hearings for the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse. Uh, it was in Washington, D.C. in 1971. And um, earlier, when David was talking about his father, uh, his, he was so self-assured. He was so uh, he, comfortable with his own intellect that he just showed no evidence of being intimidated, despite the fact that he was surrounded by uh, thir uh, yeah, 13 members of the Marijuana Commission, only one or two of whom at that point were even halfway friendly. You had a staff of people that hated marijuana smokers and marijuana, but Lester still was, he was sort of the most powerful person testifying at those hearings. Um, I also want to mention, when we talk about the impact of that book, etc., part of what was fascinating was that Lester's closest friend for many years, or at least I think his closest, was Carl Sagan, for Christ's sake, who many people think is the brightest man that ever lived on the planet. Now, uh, that may be based more on TV ratings than on our judgment, but nonetheless, we all recognize Sagan was an incredible intellectual. He's the one, I think, to a large degree, that convinced Lester he needed to rethink his positions on marijuana. Um, he, he, the two of them were doing their uh, anti-nuclear war uh, protest together. And at some point there, Carl shared with Lester the fact that he enjoyed smoking marijuana. And Lester was worried about Sagan. He thought he might have to stage an intervention or something. <laughs> well, as it turns out, of course, it went the other way. Because he uh, trusted um, his source so much in this case. Uh, he was willing to open his mind up and dive into that. And of course, as he came out of it, he became one of the strongest advocates, not just for legalizing marijuana and stop treating smokers as criminals, but he's one of the strongest advocates I've ever known for the fact that the experience of smoking marijuana, in fact, can enhance your life in a very positive manner. And most people don't have the courage to say that, even if they believe that privately. Lester did. So it was just brilliant when you'd be sitting around with some people. If we were at a conference together and these kids were dying to see you, they'd see Lester Grinson smoking a joint. And the next thing he'd be ripping off on something. They'd think, my God, this guy's a stoner. You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now, as to the book itself, let me say this. Uh, there, there were some other good books around. John Kaplan had just come out with the Marijuana, the New Prohibition. Ramsey Clark had done Crime in America. They both came out in 71, I think. Um, but none of them were anywhere near as comprehensive or convincing or intellectually based as uh, Grinspoon's book. And it wasn't, by the way, just advocating for medical marijuana, although it did that in a very positive way. It was advocating for legalizing marijuana, period. Um, so it was the most important book in terms of shaping my own thoughts in those earliest years of normal. But I think without question, uh, that was true of almost every activist I knew during the 70s. Lester Grinspoon's book was the Bible. Yeah. And by the way, um, the essay 
in Marijuana Reconsidered by Mr. X. Yes. Of course, we all know now <laughs> is Carl Sagan. And that essay, it's still a great um, description of the usefulness of marijuana, not just, oh, it's not harmful, but this stuff is great. And here's why I enjoy it. And here's how, why it's meaningful to me. And we, um, we knew that Mr. X was uncle Carl and it was a family secret that we all kept, um, you know, until after, uh, Carl died in 1996. And that was also kind of a, a cool thing that uncle Carl was Mr. X and we all knew that, but, but, uh, but had to keep it a, had to keep it a secret. It was this kind of like inside thing that we all knew. Since you, since you guys brought up, uh, Carl Sagan, um, I, I read somewhere that, uh, one of the main motivations behind Lester writing the book was actually to prove Carl wrong because Carl was trying to get him to go pro weed and he was anti and they were kind of going back and forth about it. And he was like thinking, I'll, I'll find the bad stuff to show him and ended up getting converted. I think it started off that way, but I think before very long, he realized, Jesus, I've been sold a line of shit. You know, <laughs> he realized he had been duped like everybody else. Yeah. And David, you had a personal relationship with Carl as well. Um, can you tell us a little about your dad's relationship and friendship with Carl and your relationship with Carl, just briefly? Yeah. I mean, they were really close. I, I think, um, as, as Keith mentioned, they first bonded over um, being kind of anti-war um, because, uh, you know, in the mid sixties at Harvard, uh, they were both Harvard professors who were, um, against the American involvement in the Vietnam war, which at that time was a really unpopular position. It became more popular later on, but they, uh, they, they were sort of backed into a corner together, I think at a party where they met, where they were the only two people who thought that the United States should not be in Vietnam. And so their, um, their bond was both over, um, you know, just, enjoying each other intellectually, but also being kind of uh, comrades in arms uh, against the establishment in some ways. And, and they were really close and our families were really close. We did grow up calling him uncle Carl and, and he was around the house all the time. Um, and I became, you know, good friends with, with his kids. I still am. And he was, he was an amazing sparkling personality, um, to have around. Uh, he, he would tell us bedtime stories, um, Carl Sagan, these, uh, you know, these serializations that I'm sure he was making up on the spot, but they were very detailed about he, there was a story about the seventh best swordsman in France that like every night he'd tell us like the next installment and they were, you know, very elaborate. So he was uh, an amazing person to have around and their friendship was uh, very, I mean, they, they spoke practically every day for years and years. Uh, and I think just were sort of in love with their kind of intellectual explorations. And then, uh, you know, certainly cannabis was a uh, was a big part of that bond as well. And I'm guessing that Carl m must have played some role in influencing you in becoming an astrobiologist. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I mean, having um, this uh, close family friend, basically a, a surrogate uncle, who was um, involved in the first um, planetary missions, he would you know he would show up at the house with uh, th this. Uh, eight by 10 glossy picture of like the, the latest uh, image from the Mariner nine mission at Mars. I mean, this is before the internet where you could just download it. It's like, <laughs> well, here's the latest picture yeah. of Mars. And just the idea that, that uh, this was something adults could do for a living was like <laughs> explore space was, was really something that, um, that I came to just be fascinated by and, and uh, want to emulate. So uh, yeah, a huge yeah. influence for sure. All right, well, we need to take a quick commercial break, but please stick around because we'll be right back with more on Candy Pollock. All right, and we are back here with our special tribute to Dr. Lester Grinspoon, cannabis activism icon and author of the groundbreaking book, Marijuana Reconsidered. Uh, all right, Valerie and Rick, I want to bring it over to you. Um, I know that Lester's book was a big influence on both of you uh, in your lives and careers. Uh, can you please share with us your first exposure to the book, what impact it had on you, and also your first meeting with Lester, what those circumstances are. Valerie, let's let's speak with you. Well, for me, it began after a car accident in the 70s, in 1973, and having used marijuana 
in high school and university, I had not ever thought of, of marijuana as medicine, but more as something to, um, to journey with and to take on, to take when we were on journeys and hikes and to use more to expand consciousness and to get high. And um, I was in this car accident and had a, suffered a brain trauma and began having seizures. And that was in 1973 again. And so it was based on an article, an abstract that was written, I think a Tashkin study, and then also on Lester's book to uh, sustain that belief that we began to research. My ex-husband had read in a medical journal about the study and then led to that led to Lester's book marijuana reconsidered and we were I was surprised and hopeful that something other than the plethora of medications that I was taking five anti-seizure drugs and like was like living underwater my whole life changed from being being thoughtful and inquisitive to mm -hmm. being um subdued and unconscious not really solely by the medications themselves, which are overwhelming and overpowering. And I, um, but this seizure disorder mm -hmm. and five up to five ground malls uh, in a day on occasion. Um, so finding cannabis as a, an alternative was remarkable. It was um, nothing short of miraculous. And, you know, the miracles of living on the planet and finding that nature can subdue and an experience that's anguishing, uh, that causes great deep anguish, but also be a tool for healing in such a profound and really magnificent way. And so that's when I first heard of and read um, uh, Lester's work and was very moved and thankful. Uh, and um, used, I used it along with many other um, alternatives with, no electric moving where there was no electricity and and complete diet change environmental change shifting everything in my my world and my life uh, and my, our lives my my, my ex-husband and myself and um not only that but in the, the internal world affecting my the structure of my my world and what had become quite unbelievable for me because in the 70s science um believed and espoused that the brain did not heal. So there was no way for this, uh, anything to change. And really it's fine. You're 20, when I was 20 years old when it occurred and you're on your way to this path. And this is what you will be facing probably for the rest of your life. But I was 20 and I really didn't believe anyone, which is fortunate. So, you know, 20 years old, the world is made to, to defy. Luckily, the scientific mind, not every scientist's mind, but the scientific mind is always looking for another frontier, looking for another means by which to explore. And in that exploration, I was, of others, was able to have the light, a light come on and, and really provide an application of marijuana on a daily basis. Um, I was attracted naturally to the sativas and it turns out there's a reason for that and that uh though growing our own cannabis living in a di very different unique world uh was profound and it helped to change the outcome of my life and the path of my life um so you know lester was iconic for me because he gave me an opportunity to explore a path that might, I was looking for, but I might otherwise have missed. And uh, he became, you know, my, my sort of uh, reading buddy, you know, <laughs> without knowing it. And then some years later in 1992, we were arrested for the cultivation of cannabis. And we'd had many interactions with cops, but always they let us, let us go. Uh, in, in those ensuing years, 18 years between the 70s and 90s, we uh, um, were helping other friends, the, the AIDS epidemic, um, family members with cancers, uh, were all part of um, our experience in sharing cannabis and realizing that we that was a very important part of what we did. Grow enough, share it, 
live an alternative lifestyle, uh, grow your own food, get back to the land. And that was a, <clears throat> quite the big movement. In the 90s, uh, we called on Lester to be uh, an, uh, an expert witness, in my case, and the, was the first person in the state of California to uh, apply a medical necessity defense, the, the <clears throat> points of necessity. And uh, Lester, you know, was a, a superstar and equally so in the eyes of the court. Um, and he really dazzled. Dazzled everyone, dazzled my family, dazzled um, me, of course, I was a big fan, but also um, meeting Lester, I felt Lester had a way of making me feel an, as an equal to him. His, his appreciation for, uh, I believe his appreciation for my uh, revolutionary soul was a little bit um it was quite in line with his approach to the world because he is definitely iconic revolutionary um when people break the rules in thinking when they are willing to risk really risk everything which he did uh, his position at harvard the, te the tenure the way he was observed by others for the truth that is a profound experience and uh, that is enlightening, and it enlightened me. And so I could go on for, <laughs> I'll, I'll go on later. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, Rick, how about you? Uh, tell us your first experience, uh, your first exposure to the book and first time meeting Lester. Oh, well, it's Lord. Um, well, uh, Keith and I, uh, he's on the show here as well. Uh, we were busted for smoking a joint at the, uh, Boston Freedom Rally in 2007. And, um, you know, it was for, just for a drunk, but he was the guy from normal and I was the guy from high time. So we decided to fight it. And uh, Keith knew Lester and reached out to him and asked if Lester was from Boston, of course. And so he asked if he helped out. And Lester uh, it started off our, um, our fund for uh, our defense fund with $5,000. And that gave us enough money to go back and forth to Boston, him from uh, Washington, me from New, from New York. And, uh, and before that, I mean, I was, I got started by reading Lester Grinspoon in 1995. And that kind of changed the path of my life. I started writing about marijuana. I had a pot a column called the pot page, but literally the first thing I read was Lester and he was larger than life in my eyes. And like, you know, when I started writing, even when I started writing for high times, I reached out to a lot of people, a lot of big people and got, interviews, but I never even thought I could get an interview or even talk to Lester Grinspoon. Jesus, are you kidding me? He's on another another level of this whole thing. And uh, and then Keith got him, brought him into our, our uh, defense, and we had to go up one night to a freezing night up in Boston. We went started out at the Harvard Club where we met and talked about our defense, and we went back to uh, our attorney, Charles Nesson's house, and Lester was going to show up. I'd never met him. And suddenly I was in the room with the great man himself, big gangly guy. And if you know me, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a megalomaniac and I like to make people laugh and talk. I talk a lot. And one thing I noticed about Lester is when I talked, he laughed. Now I understand why they called him chuckles. But at the time he was the guy that I made laugh so easily. He had this big, big, larger than life laugh, <laughs> like that. And I loved hearing it. And I was right from the very beginning. <laughs> And I quickly, I quickly warmed up and I quickly relaxed and uh, we got high together and I just couldn't believe I was there. So afterwards, I deigned to ask him if he would do the high times interview. And he said, yes. So uh, me and Bean, uh, David Yenstock, we went up to uh, their house and uh, to Betsy and Lester's house and we didn't expect it, but they offered to let us stay there the night and they faded us. And it was just an incredible, incredible thing. So we sat down for the interview. And uh, my experience with Lester, we became very good friends. And in the last three or four months, uh, I've been sitting here, uh, sheltered in place by myself with my dog. And, uh, and basically, I'm calling people. And so the last three or four months, luckily for me, I, I called Lester a bunch of times. And all I wanted to do, you know, he was older. You get him on a good, a good day. But, but he, was, he was always sharp. He was always there. He was always the smartest man I ever met in my life, right up until the end when I spoke with him. And he would, my, at the end, what I would do is I'd say, let me just make him laugh. 
And I would get up there and I'd tell him stories out of school. I'd say whatever I can. And I'd get that in the matter. He was, you know, he was within a month or so of dying, but he still had that laugh, that capacious, large laugh, larger than life. And I, it's just like, it was like heroin. From just keep giving it to me, you know? Okay. So he asked me at that time, I always asked him questions about his life and things. And we started doing an interview and I think I never stopped doing an interview with him. And uh, about the second to the last time I talked to him about a month ago, he said, um, I asked him a question and I forget what it was, but he said, so why are you asking me that? And I said, Lester, I'm your, I'm your Boswell. I'm going to write, I'm going to write about you. And he goes, ah, he a big laugh. Ha. He goes, you know what's the problem with that, Rick? And he goes, I, I won't be able to read any of these wonderful things you write about. And I said, Lester, that's the way this works. I get to write the stuff, uh, you know, and I said, and I don't want, I don't want you poking into that. <laughs> so I've been, I'm going to write about Lester and I've been thinking a lot since he passed about writing him. I'm thinking about the stories that he shared with me. I'm going to share one story with you that I think is, and you know, we talked before and David talked about growing up, how Lester was poor and uh, suffered anti-Semitism. He told me those stories. And he lived in this little town in Massachusetts, and it was all white Christian town. And uh, he was one of two Jewish families. And he had the three brothers were um, Lester's older brother, and Lester in the middle, and then and then Buddy. And uh, Lester was um, one year his older brother was one year older than him, and he would he was what we would call today a special a special case. You know, he had um, special needs, and so Lester grew up taking care of his older brother. And remember, this is an anti-Semitic town where this is a Jewish family. So the kids used to love um, when Lester would walk home with his brother and his little brother, Buddy tagging along, the kids would love to try and annoy them, throw rocks at the Jewish kids, try and get them pissed off and whatnot. And if they get really good with the oldest brother, he had, a, he had epileptic fits and they could get him to have an epileptic fit. And Lester had felt very strongly he had to protect his older brother and he had his younger brother at his side. One time he's walking home, they're throwing stones and sure enough, the older brother starts having an epileptic fit while Lester turns around and tries to tell the other kids to stop. And he tells me this story. He says, so on one hand, I'm trying really hard to stop and, and get him to stop swallowing his tongue, you know, taking care of his older brother. While at the other time with his, with buddy, they're going at the kids saying, get the hell out of here. You know, they're trying to fight them like kids will defend, defend the turf, you know? And uh, he told me that story and, you know, it's a terrible, terrible story about anti-Semitism. And I said, you know, I think Lester, let me ask you this. I said, so you had to take care of your brother. You grew up, you were taking care of your brother. He said, yeah. And I said, and you, you defended your family and your brothers against the anti-Semitism. And in that anecdote, it was all one there, right? He goes, yeah. I said, you know, your activism in marijuana was defined by your compassion for the underdog. And it was defined by your fighting spirit for that under, and, and it was also your caregiving. You were a fighter, you were a, a warrior for the truth, and you were a caregiver. Mm -hmm. And I think that is in the story that, you know, about them walking home. He was both the fighter and he was the caregiver. And I think that's the, the alchemy that put together the personality that made the greatest marijuana activist in the world. And uh, because he had the compassion and, and he had the fighting spirit as well. And, uh, and that's, you know, to me, that's a, the, the exemplary story of Lester and how he was, he, his personality was created. And Rick, then toward the end, and I'll tell Rick, you one other, it's a little more, uh, Rick, it's a little more. Can um, I step in for a minute? To right ahead. To simply add for the right. listeners that in addition to uh, helping us as an expert witness at the trial, et cetera, it was because of his friendship with Charlie Nesson that we had yeah, a that's famous right. Harvard law professor representing us pro bono in that trial in 2008. I wanted to get on the record that we were most appreciative of Lester's help. And remember what happened was we asked Charlie and he said no. And then what happened? And then he said no. And we were very disappointed on the day he said no. And then Lester wrote a one, uh, like four letters, uh, four words on an email to Charlie. He said, I am most disappointed. And the next day, Charlie Nesson said, OK, I'll do it. <laughs> didn't didn't <laughs> Lester write some ridiculously long affidavit for your trial? Some like 50 page something? I thought I read yeah, that. Yeah, I have it. 
Yes, yeah, 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 friend of the court. Yeah, it's a, I refer to it when I have to write about the history of marijuana because it's chapter and verse. It's all yeah. in there. All right, it's time for another quick break, but please stick around because we'll be right back with more of our tribute to Lester Grinspoon here on Anthropology. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, we are paying tribute to the life and legacy of the medical marijuana pioneer, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. Bringing it back to the testimony and the activism and everything you guys are talking about, um, the book came out in 71. So maybe I'll throw this to to you, Keith or Alan. Um, How long after the book came out did it take for Lester to really get involved with the movement and, and become involved with normal? Anyone well, wanted? I th- uh, I think he got involved by the mid seventies. The the early uh, physician experts who had the courage to come out and fight for legalization it was mostly Norman Zinberg and Lester Grinspoon. I mean, there there, there right. were a few others, but not very many. Later on, you had John Morgan and Lynn Zimmer, and th- there were lots of people. But in those early years, it was primarily Lester and Norman, and I think Lester had joined our advisory board by probably 73. And then by the late 70s, I think we'd moved him into the actual board of directors. He was uh, very active throughout the, the 70s. And you know, that was that was during the time where he, he, well, you mentioned earlier, it was the Schaefer Commission he testified at, right? He did testify at Schaefer. And yeah. then he also testified on behalf, of, you mentioned earlier, for John Lennon at his deportation hearing. Um, and I read that he did that in exchange for some signed memorabilia. Keith or David, do you, can you weigh in on this? Do you know if that's true? Can you give us a little background about the whole John Lennon thing and how he got yeah. involved? What happened was that on the witness stand, uh, the federal, the prosecutor asked me, uh, well, now, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Lennon was convicted on a hashish charge. And uh, Dr. Grinspoon, hashish, and, the, and, and see, the law in the United States doesn't mention hashish. They hadn't heard of it. They mentioned marijuana. So he, and he asked me, uh, Dr. Grinspoon, just to clear up the first fact, hashish and marijuana are the same thing, aren't they? And I said, no. <laughs> now, you know, I, I, I have to say I felt I compromised a little bit uh, there because... You know, I, in a, uh, you know, if I behaved like a pure scientist, <laughs> I, I, I might have said, they're different, but they, here are the things they have in common. They're made from the same, they do, and so forth. But I just said no. <laughs> it, I have, uh, I could go downstairs and grab it and show you. I have, <laughs> I have a copy of, uh, have a copy of Imagine that's signed uh, to David, peace and love, John Lennon, Yoko Ono. It's my my proudest possession. And it came about because, uh, so my dad, um, he went down to New York uh, and met with the defense team and um, had dinner with John and Yoko. And, and, and by the way, he the way he spoke about his interaction with them, he was just so impressed with both of them as, as people, I mean, obviously we were all in awe of the awe, in awe of them and John because he was a Beatle, but but Lester just sort of fell in love with them as as people when he got to hang out and have dinner with them, um, and just thought they were kind and interesting and and fun to hang out with. And then they took him up to the um, Apple uh, offices in New York, and they said, you know, is there anything we can do for you? Because you, you know you're helping us out. We're so grateful. And he said. Yeah, my 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 kids would love some uh, some signed albums, <laughs> so <laughs> which was a good move on his part. <laughs> we were very very glad. And and um and by the way, uh, about a week after the trial, this car showed up uh, at our house in Wellesley. This big black car, and this guy gets out and comes to the front door with the biggest, most beautiful bouquet of flowers with a, a note from John and Yoko that said, you know, with, with appreciation for your, your thoughtfulness and help. And you know, John and Yoko sent us flowers. That was pretty much like, you know, yeah, you could, you could kill me now. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I, I also read somewhere that uh, your dad, the, uh, he didn't, your dad never smoked before the book. He ended up smoking for the first time after the book had been written and published. But I read, I read somewhere that the first time he actually got high, he was listening to Sergeant Pepper for the first time and it like blew him away. And I'm, I'm guessing you had some, some, something to do with that, David. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, so, my, I mean, my dad was very much a classical music fan um, and a hi-fi buff. So, you know, we had this, those of you that were at the house, you know, we had this like massive stereo with the massive speakers and there was always Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Vivaldi playing, which I'm very grateful for that, that I got exposed to all that. Um, and I, I, I really I carry it, with me. but but we also had the typical generation wars where my brother and I we played the Beatles and the Monkees and you know all, all, all our music and uh, of course you know it was like well that rock and roll you know turn that off I'm going to turn on my classical but then um, there was the epiphany of um, the first time that uh, he got high was with. Um, his friends, the Sagans, and and this other couple, the Amatos, and they were um, they were listening to uh, Sergeant Pepper's, and um, you know my dad uh, it really moved him, and um, he always associated that album with that expansion of consciousness that came with his his first high, and of course he you know for the rest of his life he got really interested in. Um, rock music and you know the the Beatles and the Grateful Dead and all kinds of other music and it was great because we were able to really share all of that with each other and you know I feel like I music is very important in my life as well and I feel like I um, gained so much from just growing up in that house with all that music and in turn was able to return the favor with the help of you know the the miracle plant, which opens minds and broadens perspectives, and we were able to actually share a lot of music you know for the for the remaining uh, decades so uh, so I love that story about him, and I also feel personally that that it was a wonderful thing to uh, be able to share uh, the music and sort of bridge that generation gap with the help of a little uh, consciousness expansion yeah with, with a little help from my friends <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> well you know uh it seems to me like lester kind of helped shape the counterculture from the periphery he kind of nudged it from the outer edges like for instance his uh you know his activism apparently must have been working because he made it onto the president's radar at some point and not in a good way uh apparently uh, after reading a review of the of his book in the daily uh news summary nixon uh, referred to Lester in one of his infamous anti-Semitic uh, Oval Office tapes. Uh, I'm quoting here, every one of the bastards that are out for legalization of marijuana is Jewish. What the Christ is the matter with the Jews? <laughs> oh my God, what? So I know, and David, I saw you posted on Twitter um, a document where Nixon had scribbled about him in the corner of a document calling him like a far left clown or something, right? Yeah, he he circled Lester's name. It was the it was the New York Times book review review of marijuana reconsidered from 1971, which somehow made it onto Nixon's desk. And he circled the name with a little a note to Haldeman because it said H. This clown is on the far left, circling Lester's name. And when when Lester uh, found out about that, because he found out about that, I mean, he knew that he was kind of on Nixon's enemies list, but he had not seen that note specifically until this reporter from the Boston Globe did a Freedom of Information Act and he got a copy of that. And when Lester saw that, he was just delighted. And he said, wow, you know, I uh, I made it onto, you know, the enemies list of, uh, of one of history's biggest assholes. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they, they quoted yeah. that in the paper, and they said, jerks. But when he actually said it, he said, one of history's greatest assholes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had um, I had to take a little credit on here. I, I knew the story about um, about the, the Jew. Everybody knew the story about Nixon's Jewish comment, because that was a Nixon Jewish comment thing. That's how we found out he didn't like Jews. And then everybody in marijuana knew if you back that story up a little bit, he's talking about marijuana. Right. So I knew that. And I was writing one day about it a few years ago, three, four years ago. And and it said it came out on on uh, June uh, one or something like that, uh, that that he said, I said, June one. 
I said, isn't that the time? And I went and I looked back and I said, that's the week that Marijuana Reconsidered came out. That must be it. Not, I discovered that must be it, but I couldn't do anything about it. I mean, I, I suspected it. And then about uh, the story, the guy from uh, the Boston Globe was doing the story on Lester and he called me up and asked me for a, a, uh, a comment. And we, we got along very well. We're still good friends, that guy. And um, I said to him, you know, I think that Nixon, this, there's this famous Nixon quote about the Jews. I think Lester was the Jew that he was talking about. And then two days later, the guy from the Boston Globe called me back and he called San Clemente because he was from the Boston Globe. He could get them to go dig around. And he came back. He goes, you're not going to believe what I found. <laughs> and, he said, and, and they found it here and it had big red letters. He said, I know this guy. He is far left. I know this jerk. This clown. Clown, clown, yeah. Clown, yeah. <laughs> I, and one of the most satisfying moments of my journalistic life. <laughs> That's great. Well, we need to pause once again for a word from our sponsors, but don't go away because we'll be right back with more of our tribute to Lester Grinspoon here on Anthropology. Welcome back to Canthropology. I'm your host, Bobby Black. And today we are paying tribute to the great Lester Grinspoon, who passed away last month at the age of 92. Joining us here on the show are some of the people who were closest to the good doctor, including his son, David Grinspoon, Keith Strop and Alan St. Pierre from Normal, Wham! founder Valerie Leveroni Corral, and former High Times associate publisher, Rick Cusick. To take it to a little sadder note for a moment, uh, I just wanted to mention, there was a point where Lester actually put his medical research to practice and and put his money where his mouth was, and that was with your brother, Danny, uh, David. Oh, yeah. Had a brother, Danny, who was uh, sick with leukemia and uh, suffering from the side effects of chemotherapy and... uh, your mom and your dad, but I believe it was your mom who really made the first step to uh, get him some, some marijuana to try to help him, and, and it really worked. In 1967, my son, Danny, who was then 10 years old, was diagnosed as having acute lymphocytic leukemia. He had terrible nausea and vomiting with each session of cancer chemotherapeutic drugs. My wife and I heard about a young man in Houston, Texas, who had the same problem Danny had. This boy in Houston found that cannabis eliminated that nausea and vomiting altogether. So Danny smoked it 20 minutes before his next session. He had no nausea, no vomiting. He got off the table and said, Mom, could we get a submarine sandwich on the way home? And I can tell you that from that time on, for as long as he lived after that, which was about a year and a half, we never, never had to go through that awful business of his nausea and vomiting. And because the quality of his life was so much better, so was ours. We didn't have to see this suffering. And in fact, it led to the first study of uh, cannabis and nausea and vomiting. You guys went through that ordeal together as a family, and uh, of course, he eventually uh, ended up passing away. Can you just uh, mention a little something about that that time period, and uh, what was it like for your dad to see the cannabis working, and and what was it like for your family to 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 deal with that situation? Yeah, well, um, Danny got sick when he was about ten. And then he passed away um, when he was 15, when he just um, uh, about a month before what would have been his 16th birthday. And um, the thing about leukemia is, and and a lot of types of cancer like that, is that, um, you know, you go in, you have periods where you go into remission and you're okay or more or less more okay for a while. And then you have periods when it's, when it's really bad and that was sort of accentuated by the fact that they kept trying all these new medications that were coming out. And, they, you know, the, uh, my parents were really hopeful that there was going to be some kind of a breakthrough and a cure and that maybe Danny would be able to survive. They knew he had a fatal disease, but there were all these medical 
uh, possible breakthroughs. And so, uh, you know, Danny would be sick for a while and then relatively well for a while. And, uh, you know, I remember him, you know, he's my older brother and I remember him as a, you know, generally a really happy kid, even during all that time. But I also remember, you know, there were times he'd be in the hospital or be laid up in bed and, and sick. But it was definitely the case that uh, marijuana helped um, ease um, the last few years of his life. And, um, you know, when they discovered that it helped him with the chemotherapy, it was just so great because um, he would go from, you know, this, this experience that he just dreaded that was horrible to one that like was, you know, seemed like no big deal and he would laugh off. And, and, you know, he, Danny had that kind of that same, you know, chuckles, I guess, uh, attitude where, you know, he loved to laugh as well. And he was funny and he would always be joking about, uh, you know, sort of self-deprecating joking about uh, his condition and, and um, you know, just had a really good spirit. And so I think uh, I associate his uh, having access to cannabis with um, making those final years just um, much more, uh, not just bearable, but like at times really pleasant. There was a lot of laughter and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of fun to be had in those years too. And he had and Danny played played guitar. He had a, a, a Fender Strat, 1965 Fender Stratocaster that I still have and I still play. Um, that, um, you know, I just remember one time him like sitting up in bed and he was obviously not well, but he was well enough to be sitting there playing his guitar. And that's kind of what he what he focused on rather than the fact that he wasn't feeling well. And I feel that like my parents' attitude and being open to uh, the herb and to helping him out. Um, and that like really made a difference in his life. And it, that was really meaningful for all of us. And again, as you say, gave my dad a sort of personal uh, interest to go along with his uh, intellectual interest in the topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, your dad uh, also wrote a, a lot of other books uh, throughout the 1970s and 80s, uh, most of which were about illicit drugs, uh, psychedelic drugs reconsidered, psychedelic reflections, cocaine, a drug and its social evolution, and the speed culture about amphetamine use. Um, we know we know that Lester was a proud cannabis smoker. Do we know if he experimented with psychedelics or any of the other illegal drugs? Yeah, he... Um... He did. Uh, um, he did ecstasy. He tried ecstasy, and I think he found it meaningful. He was interested in other drugs, but he also he developed a heart arrhythmia um, at kind of a younger age that he lived with for, um, for decades. Uh, it's amazing that he lived as long as he did because he actually had a lot of medical conditions that um, you know were iffy at times. And I think because of the heart arrhythmia, he was specifically wary of anything that was a stimulant, a central nervous stimulant. So that made him kind of shy away from other um, psychedelics that he might have been more interested in. But I know he was he was certainly interested, and I know that uh, he did um, certainly he tried ecstasy and, and uh, I think a little bit of uh, mushrooms and other stuff, and he was. He had a good experience with it, but then I think he kind of like backed off because of the uh, the um, cardiac element of that experience. Sure. Uh, in 1993, uh, he co-authored a second book about cannabis called Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine. Uh, now, is this more of an update of kind of where he left off with Marijuana Reconsidered, building on what he had discussed before, or did it venture into entirely new territory? Um, Valerie, I'm going to kick it to you also. Uh, to weigh in on this because I know that that book came out right around the time that you were working with uh, a group of activists in California, including the late Dennis Brown, and putting together the Compassionate Use Act. And I imagine that book probably had some impact on what you guys were doing. Um, but, but uh, I mean, whoever wants to weigh in about the about that book. So, I, I, yeah, I just, uh, it absolutely had an impact. <clears throat> it had an impact on our movement. It had the scholarly um, element, which was profoundly important to not look like uh, just a ragtag team of uh, activists because there's no just about it. If we look at all social um, laws that have been inspired 
uh, the social laws in the last 80 to 100 years have all been as uh, inspired by social consciousness, activism, and by the people, social movements. So um, it was um, profoundly important, and Lester was a, um, it's really when I began to form a relationship with him as what I felt as both a friend and confidant and mentor. Um, and I, I wanted to add something, David, and there's that story where your mom, uh, where your dad was late, your mom and dad would go to with Danny for um, the treatments. And it's such a wonderful story. I think it's the heart of um, his compassion. It, it reflects the heart of, of his compassion, the sort of uh, moment where we shift. And um, he was a little bit late. And he normally, when he would go up to the, when they would arrive at the doctors for a treatment, Danny would be it would be more somber and um, stay you know, quiet and, and somber. And, and um, that at that moment that he arrived at the door, he said he heard laughter, both Danny and Betsy, your, your brother and your mom laughing behind the door. And he was struck by this reaction. And he, later in, he talked with your mom and she said that, that's, they had t- smoked. He had smoked some marijuana. I don't know if it was your mom and five too, but I don't, that he had smoked marijuana before he got to the the appointment, and it had changed the tenor, the whole real experience, and that that changed him, affected him so profoundly to hear his son, your brother, engaged in a way that opened his heart and opened the heart of potential and possibility. You know, healing, right? Healing is always happening right up to the moment of death. I don't know what happens after, but I see that in the process, as we unfold and become our own masters, we're getting getting pieces, elements of that throughout our lives. And that, that this is where the child teaches the parent. This is where the profundity of experience reaches beyond uh, a personal experience and changes the parents, the family, the world around him. So Danny is, you know, in his own right, a phenomenal activist and revolutionary soul because he was facing death. And that is the ultimate journey. I mean, ultimate as far as life goes um, and ultimate challenge. So that was a really moving experience that we, we that your father and I talked about. And, and um, really had um uh he always encouraged me i mean i feel drawn to be at bedsides and that's just something that i do you know we all have our our little our our passions that we hope we we can expand and and find uh the the grace of the experience if you want to call it that um and he really it's where your father was always encouraging he said that cannabis um would be uh marijuana would be the the sort of the daily medicine and he expected me to make some little one a day that everybody could take and i sort of look at it in a little bit different way because i think that um with that with the one a day there are particular that it's nuanced all medicine is nuanced and the future of medicine will be in that where we can test what every individual needs and, and create the kind of alchemy that um will serve the individual in the most profound and um, expeditious and most useful way. And he he told me that I was responsible for getting him, and I imagine there were many people on this call, it's true too, but that I was responsible for making sure he was in, it always had a, a baggie of cannabis. So however that occurred, it occurred. And um, he was always, um, you know, he just, it was his daily regimen. And he really put, cannabis to great use and uh, if we if we think of everything as part of a healing process then marijuana reconsidered was the uh, the kind of formula for that um, action and that awareness in our personal lives that um, w- when you look at the bigger picture and you lay it out in front of you it's undeniable and the consequence of that undeniability is that it shifts, it is like a a, a current, it has an undercurrent that will draw everybody into that awareness if 
they are touched by either personal experience, whether that's imbibing or watching, observing another. And to watch, when, when we can take the suffering out of the pain, uh, and, and the, then we're left with what's obvious, that life is not without discomfort. Death is not without discomfort either, but that one needn't suffer. And that is a phenomenal gift and something that your father really put the light on, just really shown that awareness and gave that gift to everyone. So people who don't know who he is, um, young people throughout the world, you know, it, you could probably find it in 120 characters or less. He was fucking amazing. He mm -hmm. would, he would, would shake up the world with great deep courage. And we could all learn something from that kind of deep samurai uh, awareness that he had. Cause he just cut through, just cut through it with humor and with kindness. Mm -hmm. He, um, Always, I, I know, I was speaking, I, David, you were mentioning in one of these chats that we were having about that 2011 talk that he gave. And I was, he, I was there speaking. He, and I know that he was like, I, because he was insistent that I be there speaking. And he was so encouraging and so loving. And after he, he spent part of that time applauding me and just, really never even had to do that. I mean, it was just his, through his kindness that he did that. It was through his generosity that he did that. It was really, you know, how a, a great teacher will say, come on, just go for it. And really shared, shared the stage of life, shared, shared the stage of experience, stage, shared the stage of intellectualism, shared the stage of human kindness. He shared that. So it made an experience personal experience happen that would never be less than profound if you if you you could take it anywhere and he really you know i just i miss him dearly as i know everyone here does and more people um, just i miss that um the confidant you know you know you'll never be loved in exactly that same way and so that's just uh, deeply moving and, and and he makes me smile. And um, yeah, so it's really, really remarkable friend. Great loss to the world. Indeed. Well, it's time for us to take another quick commercial break, but please don't go away because we'll be right back with more on Anthropology. All right, and we are back once again here on Canthropology with our special tribute to cannabis activism icon, Dr. Lester Grinspoon, who passed away last month. Before the break, you, uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned something about a shakeup, and uh, I wanted to bring up, uh, Alan, we haven't heard from you in a while, if you're still there. Um, it's my understanding that in 1994, there was a pretty big shakeup over at Normal, uh, at the board of directors and Lester was brought in to sort things out. Um, and that was around the same time that Keith, you came back into the organization. Um, Alan, uh, if you're there, would you mind uh, telling us a little about uh, that whole situation at normal and what Lester did when he was brought in? Sure. So in 1994, uh, the normal board for all intents and purposes imploded and couldn't uh, get over a number of uh, fundamental problems at the time. And so uh, rather than have a protracted uh, board fight, um, Lester uh, was contacted and uh, was willing to uh, put forward his good name and reputation to try to pull together a entirely new board uh, with some uh, holdovers from the previous one, as it turned out to be. Um, and uh, everybody was immediately deferential to such. And I'm so glad they were because I've been at normal at that point about four years. And uh, for every good reason in the world, I probably have departed at that time, but it was the gravitas of Lester, uh, one, bringing Keith back to the fold entirely full time, and two, that he put together this a uh, great board of directors of like Lynn Zimmer and John Morgan and Louis Lasagna and Hans Mohammed, uh, 
a bunch of other really you know, notable academics in the field of cannabinoid studies. And so uh, from that forward, we were able to not only uh, rest, bring normal back uh, from the brink, but also uh, by uh, tax necessity, set up a separate foundation uh, for which uh, Lester was instrumental in, in helping that get going and getting early funding for it. And so this also was a, the time when uh, his book was coming out um, and he was busy promoting that. And uh, it was without a doubt the... Uh, the seriousness of, of his writing uh, lent to the incredible activism that was going on largely in the San Francisco area with Dennis Perone and Brownie Mary and others. And so uh, you had Lester on the East Coast lending all this sort of intellectual gravitas with marijuana, uh, the forbidden medicine, and you had the activists out there pushing the envelope to the extent that we have legal marijuana um, in many parts of the country today because of these two unique forces working together. Amazing. Um, Keith, did you have anything to add add to that? Well, I certainly agree with Alan that that phase from uh, the mid 90s forward, actually, I think we'll, we will look back on them in many ways as a golden years for normal. I think we uh, Lester pulled together a terrific board of directors. One name Alan uh, w would have used and forgotten, sure, was Annie Drian, by the way, Carl Sagan's widow. Oh, sure. He served on our board for a long, long time, still does on the advisory board. But uh, John Morgan wouldn't have been involved, but for Lester and Lynn Zimmer wouldn't have been involved. So uh, just the fact that you've got a board that has become intractable, they've, they've split into at least two parts and they can hardly speak to each other. And they actually had one board meeting where at least the story I've heard, one side picked up and knocked the entire table over. It was that uncivil. And so the only thing the board could agree on is that they trusted Lester's judgment and they knew what whoever he picked for this new board would be good for normal and good for the movement. And so I thought he was without a doubt the only person who would have had uh, the uh, consent of both sides. So uh, wonderful time. So 1994 is also uh, coincidentally the year I started working at High Times um, and I began to learn about Lester. Uh, he was uh, definitely, as Rick said, a revered figure among the staff there. Um, and it wasn't until many years later when I was working at the High Times slash Normal booth up at the Boston Freedom Rally, because we always shared a booth there, always such fun times. Um, but there was one year there, I don't remember the year, that I finally got to meet. He came out and I got to meet Lester and smoke with him. And um, like you were saying, Valerie, you know, um, you have this larger than life reputation and you revere this person and you're not afraid, but almost like, oh, you know, like, and he just, he was very sweet and disarming and supportive. And just like you said, you knew that his intellect was way beyond mine, but never made you feel like he was looking or talking down to you. He treated everyone, as far as I could tell, on a very equal footing. And so that was really, uh, I, I enjoyed, I grew to enjoy and look forward to seeing him and spending time with him when we'd go up each fall. Of course, the one year I couldn't make it was the year that you guys got arrested, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, and then that one year, thanks to you, Rick, what, that one year uh, I got invited, April and I, and, and Danny Danko got invited with you to go to uh, Lester and Betsy's home, and they grilled up some food for us, and we hung out, and it was really nice. It was the only time I got to see their home, but it was a just a beautiful, welcoming uh, experience, and I, I have really... Nice memories of that. Uh, do any of you have any special memories that you'd like to share of visits to the home that you maybe want to uh, record for posterity? I'll just jump in and say from the perspective of a, of a family member, the fact that Lester was always bringing people to the house was just really cool. You know, it was an amazing um, environment growing up because um, all these activists and intellectuals and, um, you know, just really interesting people would be over socializing at, at our house. And so that, you know, and, and, you know, obviously, you know, people like Carl Sagan and, um, you know, some other uh, sort of big names uh, were, were there a lot, but also just Lester was just like really loved um, socializing with people that shared his interests and his causes and his passions. And so 
the house itself was uh, was just a place where there were always um, conversations and shared meals and laughter and um, you know that environment was um, you know just just it's just interesting hearing you guys talk about like going out to the house because from the perspective of a kid who was growing up there it was like oh all these cool people were always coming over to the house <laughs> yeah. Rick, uh, I know you had a, a particularly, uh, I think, a cool story about your experience at Lester's home. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I had lucky enough to have gone up there a number of times. Uh, once I became friends with Lester, as I, I talked about the other day, I was a single dad and I needed help. I needed advice. And there was no better advice than uh, Lester nor Betsy. And uh, I leaned on a lot. My daughter went up there a lot. She became good friends with them. And, uh, and uh, one time... <laughs> Uh, though I made a very specific trip, and I'll, uh, as you know, and I know you and David uh, were in Amsterdam, and, and when uh, Smoke Grinspoon, Doctor Grinspoon, the uh, the um, strain that's named after Lester, and uh, what how that happened was um, the um, Barney's, which is the one who created the Doctor Grinspoon uh, strain. Uh, they were uh, advertisers of high times, and we knew them well, and we made a lot of money for them. One day we were out at lunch. The high time staff was out at lunch. We said, "Wouldn't it be great if we could get Lester Grinspoon his own his own strain? That would be cool." And somebody said, "You should call Barney's up." Yeah, okay. So I called Barney's up, and I thought I had to explain it to him. I said, "Listen, there's this guy," and he said, "Lester Grinspoon? No, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that." And I had talked to Lester, and he wouldn't he wouldn't mind it. And I mean, you know, he just jumped on it. He wanted to do it right away, and he got a really special plant. It was great great marijuana that was created in Dr. Grinspoon. But it was there for a couple of years, even ran it, won a cup, but it was there, but Lester never tried it. And then one time, I'd say, I don't know, 20, 12, I'm not really sure, 2012, 2013, something like that. We, uh, we told Danny Danko, okay, your mission is to bring back Grinspoon seeds. And he did. He smuggled some Grinspoon seeds into the United States. I know he won't admit it, but he did. And then we took that and Lester had uh, some friends who were growers that were our friends too, Tom and uh, Eileen. And uh, they were growers up in Massachusetts. We gave them the seeds. They grew it out. They got an ounce of pot. The pot went back to Danny. It came to me on the weekend. I was, I had a day off. I got on a train just to do this. I went all the way to Massachusetts. I got on the train cause I don't drive. I went out. I had Lester pick me up the, at the train station, he brought me back. And I said, I got something very special for you, Lester. What's that? And I snapped the bag up and I said, Dr. Grinspoon. And he knew what that was. He said, really? I said, yes, sir. This is it. We got it back. So Lester and I went up and he, he used to get high in his, back then he used to get high up in his bedroom. <laughs> and, the, and the thing, we went up to the bedroom, we had a, a volcano. And I had the honor of smoking Dr. Grinspoon with Dr. Grinspoon. And uh, that was probably the best time I think I ever went up to the house. I was I, like, you know, I talked the other day about every stoner has a great, the greatest time I ever got high, the coolest time I ever got high. Without a doubt, the coolest time I ever got high was when I smoked Dr. Grinspoon with Dr. Grinspoon. I, I have a really great uh, smoking Dr. Grinspoon with Dr. Grinspoon story too. But before I get into that, uh, yeah. I'd like to kick it back to Valerie because she uh, has to get going soon. So I wanted to give her an opportunity to say any final thoughts or, or memories she'd like to share. Go ahead. I just want to say that, you know, for those of you who will not be able to get high with Lester because he's not here presently to do so, they're one of the great all-time experiences of my life. Many of the all-time great experiences of my highs have been in Lester's company and with his um, ability to open, oh, be completely open, to open his heart and to laugh and to really, as you so aptly put it, Rick, his full, rich laugh that enveloped the space. Um, we would go when we'd meet at conferences or we would go to like, more like a late, a late, you know, lunch rather than dinners, but, um, and have, uh, always have a walking, ex a jaunt with, with smoking a joint and, and, uh, having, having a, a meal together. And the thing about Lester's ability to speak about on so many topics, 
and so richly with a, such an inquisitive, uh, always inquisitive, in as much as he was so concerned about engaging conversation. And really, it's one of the truly remarkable thing about people that love to engage, to speak, and to communicate. Deep communication inspires a deep thinking. And I, for me, that legacy that, that Lester leaves is that richness to, to fall into, to expanding consciousness was a part of what we spoke about. So if, you know, if consciousness is spirit or, or essence, or then that is a deeply profound uh, relationship to engage with another human being. So I find that his ability to encourage deep thought it's the kind of professorship that a person takes when they want to include you, include your greatest part, pieces and greatest aspects into um, uh, an experience. So he's, a, you know, he's just larger than life. That's probably why he feels so present still, because he's really larger than life. And I just thank you so much for this opportunity. I do apologize for jumping off here because I'm, we're moving our offices finally to a place where, that we can uh, provide cannabis from. So we're really excited about that, but it's moving is moving. And uh, yeah. Yeah. thank course. you so much for this. Thanks to all of you, my friends. Thank you for making you. time for us. I know it wasn't easy for you to find time, but I appreciate you so much being a part of this. Um, well, it's at least, are you kidding? It's a complete honor. And I really appreciate that you're doing this and giving a big, bigger voice to a magnanimous human being that has a voice that shall echo through time. Thank you all. Thank you, every one of you, colleagues and friends. And much love. Thank you, Valerie. Be well. You bet. Thank you. All right. We need to take one last commercial break, but please stay with us. When we return, we will be concluding our tribute to the late, great Dr. Lester Grinsby. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the final segment of this extended edition of Canthropology, honoring the life and legacy of cannabis activism icon, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. Joining us today are our esteemed guests, David Grinspoon, Keith Strop, Alan St. Pierre, Rick Cusick, and Valerie Leveroni Corral. All right, let's pick up where we left off. Uh, it was wonderful speaking with Valerie. Um, and when we last uh, left off, you, Rick, had told a wonderful story about the uh, process you went through to get the strain named Dr. Grinspoon into the hands of the actual Dr. Grinspoon, and you got to share it together uh, with him for the first time. Yes. Well, I have a similar kind of story. Uh, <laughs> so after you had pressured uh, Barney's, Derry at Barney's, to name a strain after him, shortly after that, apparently, I went to Amsterdam in May of 2009 to do uh, a big expose story about the coffee shop industry uh, for High Times. Um, and called Coffee Shop Confidential. And uh, Barney's was the main coffee shop that I was going to be covering because Derry, the owner, was a friend of mine. And he was giving me uh, behind the scenes access of the operations that no other coffee shop owner would have given me. Um, so April and I got to town and he explained to me that he had this new heirloom sativa strain that he was very proud of and he was naming it after Dr. Grinspoon. Uh, and so... We're, so we're in Amsterdam doing this. And a few days later, April and I are sitting in his restaurant, uh, Barney's Uptown, and in walks Derry with some guy who we've never met before. And Derry introduces him to us as David, Dr. Grinspoon's son. And so we're like, whoa, <laughs> this is this is wild, you know? So, uh, it, and it turns out, Dave, David, you had just been at some conference across the channel in London or something. Is that right? Yeah, it was a, it was a I, I believe I was at a planetary science conference uh, in England. And then um, we were uh, vacationing uh, for a few days in, in Amsterdam, just decided to uh, hang out and have some fun for a few days. So did you know that there was a strain named after your dad? Is that why you came or was that a pleasant surprise? No, no, I had heard of it, but I'd never tried it. 
and then I found out that Barney's was the was the place uh, to check it out. So uh, I, I was actually on a mission, and uh, and my dad had um, I guess I guess Lester um, knew Derry, or they were they were in touch, and he had actually given me like um, you know the the entree, and and so like I when I got to town, I I think I. Yeah, I called him and I said, "Hey, I'm Lester Grinspoon's son, and you know, I want to come over and check it out." He's like, "Sure." So, yeah, yeah we, I, I had, I had, I had gotten a hookup from Lester. <laughs> it was, it was so fortuitous that you happened to be there when we were there because, I mean, that's how I met you, and uh, we got to sample your dad's strain and his namesake strain together for the first time. And I remember us having dinner together and smoking and waxing philosophical for hours. Uh, about everything from shamanism and the origins of life to weather patterns on Venus. And, uh, you know, your dad's strain was some pretty good shit. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was a really memorable evening. I remember the meal and the conversation and the smoking. And, and you know, I don't know if it's just psychological because of the the attachment, knowing that it's named after Lester, but I swear it's like probably my, my favorite uh strain of all kind it's it's um just like the description says uh if you go to like the you know the barney's page or whatever it describes it as a long lasting cerebral high and that's just so perfect for lester you know the the cerebral part and uh it's it's yeah it's really good stuff i was gonna ask uh does did he have a favorite kind of weed a favorite strain or was he more of a sativa indica what was he what was he into do you know does anyone know he likes trying new things. I don't know that he had like a particular strain that like, was his go-to strain. He was, you know, I think because he was Lester Grinspoon, people were always uh, giving him little presents. Yeah. And he was, uh, um, you know, so he always had a good stash. And he was, uh, I think he was just interested in, in, in trying them all, really. Okay. Um, well, you know, unlike uh, you guys, I never really, I mentioned, had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Lester beyond the few encounters at the rallies and the, the one time at his home. But uh, thankfully, through my friendship with you, David, I was able to speak and smoke with Lester one final time at your wedding in 2015. I'm very thankful to have had that opportunity. Um, I, I often thought, um, Rick was saying earlier about being afraid to ask for an interview, you know, which is kind of silly, but in your mind, you know, it's, he's this, you know, larger than life person. And I often thought of reaching out to him to do an interview, but I knew his health had begun to decline at that point, And I felt like I might be bothering him. So I didn't. Um, so that, well, that's one regret I have is that I never got to like actually interview him before he was gone. But um, when was the last time each of you saw or spoke with him? And what do you think it is about him that you'll miss the most? Whoever wants to jump in. Uh, I spoke with him about uh, 10 days before he passed. And uh, like I said, um, he was absolutely there. And we told, I told him a long, involved story about high times that he knew. And he laughed. You know, there, there was a laugh line at the end of it. And as soon as I got to the laugh line, he burst into a laughter. And I said, he got it, he, you know. And, um, and that was the last time uh, we spoke. And, uh, and I, that's what I'll remember. I'll remember I made him laugh the last time we spoke. I, just I will always remember that laugh. Anyone else? I uh, I actually, you know, the night before he died, he died the morning after his ninety second birthday, and the night before that, we actually had a family Zoom birthday party for him, which is amazing that we were able to do that, and everybody um, was yeah. on there. His. Uh, uh, Betsy was there with him and, and then uh, all his kids and uh, most of his grandkids were on this Zoom. And Lester, you know, he wasn't in the best of health, but he was there that night and he was present and he was engaged and he told a story and told a joke and he was laughing. And yeah, his laughter is, um, you know, something that uh, was was just a, a wonderfully infectious uh, thing. and. Um, to me, it's just such a gift that we all were able to be with him that night. And, it, you know, it really was kind of our goodbye, although we didn't know it at that time. Uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful. So, that, you know, that's, that's the last time I spoke to him was, was uh, that night of his uh, birthday a, a few weeks ago. And, you know, I cannot say 
any one thing that I'll miss the most, except for, um, you know, just being able to talk to him about new things. I, um, you know, I'm, I feel good about the fact that he lived a long life and lived well. And, you know, in that sense, his death is not a tragedy the way it is with, with some other people. Um, you know, it's, a, he had a beautiful life and he died peacefully and that's great. Um, but of course, we'll miss him. And I already miss being able to tell him new things. I'll see something or hear about something and want to show him and want to tell him something. And I'll just be like, oh, shit, I can't. Yeah. Keith or Alan? Um, I think I last spoke with Lester perhaps a year and a half ago or so. Um, I remember distinctly, um, I'm an old man myself, and I have memory problems. And I could tell Lester was having some me memory problems. And I kind of feel like uh, I've grown up with Lester. Because for most of, I, I'd say for 40 of the last 50 years, if we had a call from a, a national media source, national newspaper, television, an interview that was important, Lester was usually the first person we called because he would be our best spokesperson if he were available. And he usually would be available as well. So um, I was sad when I spoke to him two or three times after he had moved out of the house and into the retirement home, because I could tell that he was having memory problems. But as I say, Christ, I have mem memory problems myself. So um, I, I quite understand. He was still uh, certainly warm. I, I, frankly, I think he had called me looking for the email or phone number of a mutual friend. I can't remember the details now. Um, at any event, we haven't used him for a few years because he retired and because, you know, I think he, he kind of wanted off the circuit. But for 40 of the last 50 years, he was uh, he was riding the, the first horse uh, heading down that circuit, and he no one was better than Lester. Alan? Yeah, I um, I was able to talk to Lester on uh, 420 this year, and I usually would call him uh, on 420 and on his birthday. And we would go up, uh, would take the kids up to see him and Betsy up at their uh, place uh, in Newton, and uh, which was really interesting to, to eat dinners and lunches there. Um, when they were... Um, um, <laughs> with the kids and you know there's a 102 year old folks sitting at the table with us and there's a two-year-old and it was just great to to span the the ages and and uh lester was an excellent guide in, in those discussions and in those conversations there and um, so i'm really glad my kids got a chance to meet him um i told a story the other day that uh indicates how uh, Lester uh, had an impact even on a two-year-old and that he would take uh, our daughter up to his library and, and run her hands along the spines of his book and say gently to her that books are your friend, books are your friend. And um, about uh, two years later, when she had a younger brother who was bouncing up and down on his books and being destructive of them, she took him aside and gently said, books are your friends books of your friends and that was 100 percent luster that was a, a, a lasting impact of, of the kind of uh, subtle ways he was able to teach even very young children so i will miss uh, all those interactions with him um you know both the substantive ones having to do with marijuana and marijuana law reform but probably more so the ones having to do with life experiences and the things that were happening with both of our respective families um, I really enjoyed going to, to all three boys weddings over the years and, and that gave me even greater insight uh, into the family and the, uh, the cousins and all their friends and it just uh, uh, as noted by a number of other people during these memorial services uh, the Grinspoon family itself is just really quite remarkable and uh, uh, it's just been a pleasure to know them. You know, you, you mentioned that you had last seen him on 420. Uh, this past 420, we, uh, World of Cannabis, actually partnered with the Cannabis Business Awards to host an online event we called 420 Icons, where we, we named the top 100 cannabis influencers of all time. Um, and obviously, Lester was one of those. Uh, Keith, Rick, you were part of that broadcast. Uh, so that was uh, really, really special. And I still have to get that certificate uh, to your family, David. Uh, of his certificate. Uh, we should also mention real briefly uh, some of the other awards that Lester has won and that have been named after him. Uh, 1999, Normal Board of Directors established the Lester Grinspoon Award, their, your highest honor, uh, and he was the first recipient. 
uh, High Times later named their Lifetime Achievement Award after him, the Lester Grinspoon Lifetime Achievement Award. There's also uh, a band down in Australia, apparently, called Grinspoon, who named themselves after him. And we've already mentioned the, uh, the cannabis strain, of course. So, so that's, uh, you know, quite a, quite a few honors that uh, have been bestowed upon Lester over the years. Before we wrap things up, uh, any final thoughts uh, or anything we may have forgotten to mention that you'd like to chime in on? Well, I would simply add that in addition to being our intellectual leader, excuse me for my dog in the back, okay. uh, Lester was also an incredibly warm individual and several of the other participants have made that point already. Uh, spending time with him was a pure joy in addition to advancing all of our careers. Well, and I just want to echo back that he got so much out of all of you guys, the community of activists and writers um, and scholars and people that were interested um, and shared his passions and, and um, his shared the movement with him. You know, he, uh, as his, as his well-known, uh, he, you know, he thrived in the academy at Harvard and in academia, but they didn't always um, give him the uh, recognition he deserved. Or sometimes, you know, he got shit for being out on the leading edge that he was on. But it, it really didn't matter to him that much. And increasingly, and especially because um, he got so much out of the community of people that uh, were engaged in this issue with him and, you know, say he, he didn't need Harvard because he had you guys. So I want to thank you for that. And yeah, he was like, he was like green, right? He was denied professorship because, because of his book in, in essence. Yeah, he did. He did not get a full professorship, which is, you know, objectively silly given his uh, level of accomplishments. And there was a time when that bothered him and then really, um, it ceased to bother him. And he would, again, you know, if you mentioned it, you would be able to evoke one of those famous laughs we've been <laughs> talking Duckle. about. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the spirit with which he would discuss yeah. it. Rick, final thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just building on that for a second. Um, one time I, I spoke to Lester about him not getting his full professorship and he had a great line. I said, so did it cause you any regrets? Do you have any regrets about that? And he said, well, if you define a doctor's uh, life by how many accolades and uh, professorships you get, I suppose I, I lost a little something. Because, but if you define a doctor's life by how much pain they stop, I think I'm doing fine. And I said, man, that's, I, that's exactly the perspective because that's the truth. Yeah. He's a doctor with the capital D. And when I heard he died, uh, the first thing that occurred to me, and I've said it over and over again for the past two weeks, First line that occurred to me was from Arthur Conan Doyle. I heard Lester died, and I thought, Lester, and I thought, and I said, and I quoted Arthur Conan Doyle to myself upon hearing it. He was the best and wisest man I've ever known. He, of course, Arthur Conan Doyle was talking about Sherlock Holmes, but he was our Sherlock Holmes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, Alan, any last uh, thought? Well, um, just that, you know, we've lost other luminaries in the marijuana law reform movement. I mean, two come to mind that intersected with Lester, uh, Todd McAria, uh, another MD, a pioneering pot doctor on the West Coast. But they were totally different when it came to their approach of uh, uh, talking to a mass audience about marijuana. Uh, Todd was decidedly more radical than Lester. But to know them both and to see, uh, enjoy their uh, and benefit from their academic work was terrific. Uh, the other would be Jack Herrera, uh, who, who also enjoys this strain of marijuana named after him and uh, is so legendary for his uh, book writing and activism. But again, totally different style than Lester. Uh, but I think Lester um, uh, sort of rises above them both in so many different ways in that uh, it was his, largely his scholarship uh, and his intellect and the um, social risks he took to um, engage fully in marijuana law reform early on. So um, beyond the fact he was a great sort of humanist uh, and a wonderful person to spend time with and to learn from. So uh, a great person to smoke cannabis with on this earth. Right on. You bet. Well, uh, if this 
pandemic situation ever ends, then hopefully I hope to see you all again in person and share a joint in his honor together. Until then, though, I'm, I guess that's going to wrap things up for our show today to this very special tribute to Lester Grinspoon here on Canthropology. David, Keith, Alan, Valerie, Rick, thank you all so, so much for joining us today and sharing your personal memories and stories and insights with us. It's been a real honor to have you all on the show. Thanks, thank Bob. you for doing it, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Great to I see you all. Great I'd also like to thank very quickly our media partners, Cannabis Radio, Hayes Radio, as well as Leaf Magazine, Canasaur, Skunk, Canapolitan, and Greenleaf Magazines. And of course, thanks to all of you out there for watching and for listening. I hope you, you've enjoyed this broadcast, and I hope you'll all join us again next time on Canthropology. Until then, this is Bobby Black, and I am History.